This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Help others discover UCTV podcasts by leaving a comment or rating for us in iTunes. We've all experienced uh, discoveries or technologies that have uh, disrupted our habits. And none of us go now b back to Blockbuster to rent a movie. We go to Netflix and do streamlining of the movie. And none of us go to travel agencies anymore to get a, uh, a, tra a plane ticket. We use the internet. And so our next speaker is going to be uh, discussing a topic that appears to me as a potential d disruptive technology, and uh, that's the artificial kidney. Uh, Dr. Shuvaroy uh, is a professor of bioengineering and uh, uh, therapeutic science at UCSF, has been working for several years uh, on uh, developing an implantable artificial kidney. I don't know if he wants to put the transplant people out of business or the dialysis, but you can take your pick. But nevertheless, we have, uh, we're very happy that uh, uh, he's, he came to present uh, his uh, uh, development strategies and to tell us when is this going to become a reality. Welcome to Napa. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vincente, and thanks to all of you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present some of our work. So uh, first of all, let me say that contrary to what you may read in the popular press, we're not going to put anybody out of business. Uh, okay. uh, they, and as we all learn, you know, what gets written in the press uh, can usually be just a little exaggerated. <laughs> But uh, what I thought I'd do today is tell you a little bit about the work that we've undertaken at UCSF uh, over the past few years, and then myself, uh, previous to UCSF, uh, when I was at the Cleveland Clinic, starting on implanted renal replacement. And uh, over the last five years, we've been fortunate to make some advancements, and there's still some ways to go. And I'll share um, some of the technical um, achievements we have and also give you a sense hopefully, for what is yet to be done. So obviously, you guys know this data, only 25, 20 percent of people that need transplants are actually getting the transplants. Uh, and that number, at least that graph, to an outsider like me, looks sort of alarming. We're leveling off. And the other part that particularly interests me as an engineer is the cost. Now, people hear about the costs, and what blew my mind away was the average hemodialysis patient costs Medicare about $85,000 annually. And that's uh, three times more than what a transplant patient costs. What does that mean? So as I started talking to my nephrology colleagues and I started talking to some of the other coll colleagues outside of medicine, and I did some multiplications, okay, 85,000, you multiply it by the uh, 400,000 uh, dialysis patients or whatnot, Turns out that's about 33 billion. If you're 24 billion, then you add the transplants, about 33 billion that ESRD puts a burden on Medicare. What's amazing is that 33%, that 33 billion is consumed by 1% of the Medicare population. Okay. And that 33 billion is also about 7%, 5%, 6% of the Medicare budget. If you ever take the opportunity to look through the USRDS report, there's no other single disease that has that kind of burden on Medicare. In the discussions of affordability, I think we sort of have lost this. We talk a lot about cardiovascular disease and its costs, cancer and its costs, but we forget about ESRD, and you guys know that. The other statistics I heard last fall at the, uh, from the uh, American Society of Nephrology is as a nation, we invest about $26 per kidney disease patient in research. We spend $550 per cancer patient. Okay. 
And just, you guys know the mortality statistics, and just blow, blows my mind away. So it occurs to me, where do we go? And I start saying, maybe the way to look at this is look at, let's look at arrhythmia. And what happened in arrhythmia? You're going back 20, 30 years, you've got a system that's a desktop, sits by the bed, that provides therapy. Over the years, you have something that's portable, okay? What do we have today? We have something that's implantable, like some of the people at UCSF say, keeps Dick Cheney alive, right? <laughs> so, but look at the paradigm that is enabled. And I think it took a merging of engineering and medicine to make this happen, and obviously has changed countless lives. Where are we with renal replacement? This is not that different from what we've had for a long time. We have this today, and that's only half the machine, as you guys know, okay? But that's what they show in the pictures, right? So the question is, what can we do next? And I like to think that the technology generally exists to get to something that's comparable to the implantable defibrillator. So we talk in the context of an implantable bioartificial kidney. And what this is, and as you'll notice, I'm taking an approach of let's set the goal and then work towards it, uh, is an implanted device the size of a little coffee cup, and here's actually a little plastic model uh, of what we think we're gonna achieve. So this is going to be something that has both a mechanical filtration component, very much to perform the glomerular ultrafiltration, couple that with a bioreactor of cells to provide some of the metabolic functions. So, and then, this is small enough that we can permanently attach it to the vessels and provides therapy 24 seven. So can we get there? And what does it take for us to get there? So as it turns out, one of my colleagues about 10 years ago, this is an internist at the University of Michigan, uh, David Humes, had an experiment underway for acute kidney injury patients. These are patients, most of them were infection and trauma, that's kidneys are shut down. And as you guys know, at the time, the mortality rates were high, so he hypothesized that just intensive CR, uh, intensive uh, renal replacement was not good enough, and he coupled two off-the-shelf cartridges into what we call a nephron-like architecture. So first was an ultrafiltration, very much like standard CRRT. He coupled that with a second cartridge that he lined up with kidney cells, that were isolated from an organ that could not be transplanted. Uh, this is a lot of work, obviously, and here what you see in the picture on the right-hand side is the ICU, and the whole system there is the pump and power systems. But he was able to take this and apply this to a number of animal studies, some early feasibility studies on humans, and then he took it to a phase two uh, clinical trial. And the data, to me was you know, mind-blowing when I saw it. These patients that at the time had an 86% uh, mortality rate you know, came out, not only, not only did they come out surviving, they survived over 60% at the six-month rate. And the patients that uh, won CRT, the ones that made it, you can see from the, the curve, is the lowest survival rate. And with a lot of the analysis that went in, you know, it, it, you could attribute that the survival was really due to the cells. So what is he looking for? In, in, uh, in um, the AKI model, he's looking at some of the immunoprotective effects, metabolic functions. But the data that really caught my attention in one of his papers uh, was there was the, the bioreactor was reabsorbing selectively about 60% of the ultrafiltrate. Now, as you may already know, in the ICU, you may not really care too much about it because there's a pump to infuse a replacement fluid. So I don't know that he necessarily paid as much focus on it, uh, but I caught onto that because he was basically a system that was working like the proximal tubule. And so the idea is, can we miniaturize his system to provide ultrafiltration 
and use the cells to provide selective reabsorption. At the same time, get some of the other benefits he had shown in terms of vitamin D production, some of the uh, amin <coughs> ammoniogenesis and the like. And the question comes in, well, how do, you, how do you miniaturize it? Is the technology there? And you look at the technology that's around, and what I think I realized was all that all that's equipment around the patient that was in the ICU was designed to pump blood and help monitor the patient, but pump blood through these hollow fiber cartridges that you guys are very familiar with. And that technology has not fundamentally changed for 40 years. And it's a technology that we developed here in the Bay Area, uh, on, in the East Bay, by Dow Chemical. So the hollow fiber membrane technology is thick, and on the left-hand side is a picture of a lumen, of a single fiber. Here's the blood lumen, here's the, ultra, uh, the dialysate or ultrafiltrate side. It's relatively thick, about 30 to 40 microns thick. It's got a tortuous path of pores, not uniform. And when you contrast that to some TEMs, which I did for the, for the glomerulus, what jumped out was in the, in the glomerulus, the pores are very tightly controlled in size. It was very thin, micron or less. Okay, and there's almost uh, the, um, the, there's also just a charged component to it. It is not only just steric repulsion of the uh, filtration, but there's also a charged repulsion of some of the proteins. So the question is, maybe we can do something that mimics the glomerular, uh, glomerular ultrastructure more than what the hollow fibers do. And can we do that? And because these are made of polymers, the hollow fiber technology over time, as you guys are degrade and cause inflammatory effects, and sometimes, sometimes they clot. So the key is, what technology lets us make in a manufacturable way features that are at that size scale, you're talking about nanometer size scale, that we can control with ult, you know, ult, ultimate precision. So we look at Silicon Valley and all the technology that has gone in to make electronics. So I call that silicon microfabrication. People use the term nanotechnology. But this is the technology in our iPhones, in our laptops, in our uh, Google Glasses today. You know? So this technology has been around for about 50 years. And what we do, and I have a silicon wafer for anybody who wants to see one, is we use a very manufacturable technology. And what we do is pattern features with precision, micron, submicron features, and do this in a layered manner to create electronics, to create accelerometers for your car airbags, gyroscopes that go in your iPhone so that when you tilt it, you know, you can, uh, it shifts the uh, screen. But this technology has been around for 50 years, been perfected for manufacturing, but you can control the features down to a few nanometers. The state of the art, they're patterning features down to two or three nanometers. So the question is, can we take this membrane, te this technology and build membranes out, out with it? And that was the value proposition. And if we can do that and do it in a reliable way, uh, we have a way to make a very efficient membrane that mimics the glomerular ultrastructure. So next question comes, what is this device supposed to do? So let me just go back to the point that you, know, you, you may have seen some of the, our work in the, on the UCSF press and other press where we're building the full kidney. We are targeting to build some very key specifications. And I think um, we can share what some of the specifications are. One is we're trying to build an implantable device, so small portable device. Okay, So it's, I say packaged no larger than 750 milliliters, maybe a little bigger than that, but something that can be implanted. Key is no pumps, no battery, because as you know from implanted electronics, that is the largest size component of, say, a pacemaker or defibrillator. So by getting rid of that, we can achieve a compact device. And if we did that, you know, we have something that obviously could run uh, forever in principle. So how do we do that? The membrane has to be efficient so it just run, the device runs just off per cardiac perfusion pressure. Second, what's the, what, is, what are we trying to achieve? I think we set a goal of saying, if we, uh, if we can get to 30 milliliters of clearance, we are pretty happy. Not 70, not 100, what not. We think this takes the patient off dialysis and gives a level of quality of life that you, know, you guys can help them manage. So you're not going to put anybody out of business. We still need you guys here. 
So to get to that, mem to get to that number, we need a technical parameter called membrane hydraulic permeability. We need to achieve that number. Uh, to, give you an assess, to give you an idea, extended dialyzer today, the dialyzer cartridges, that number of 10 millimeters per minute per millimeter market per millimeter squared, that number is on the order of about uh, 0.5. So we need something that's 20 times better. Third, we need a membrane that doesn't lose albumin, but you have to say, you know, what's an acceptable loss if we had to lose some albumin? What's the saving coefficient? So we said that to be you know, one to two grams. And then fourth, we are operating the ultrafiltration mode. So if you take 30 milliliters of clearance, multiply that by uh, 1440 minutes in a day, that's about 45 liters. Well, one way is you, know, you get a drink 45 liters, replace 45 liters. But maybe the way to do this is if we can use a cell bioreactor to reabsorb most of that uh, uh, water, then we can make it to uh, the obligate fluid loss can be decreased. So we said 43. Now you talk to different colleagues, different patients. They're like, you know, 43 is, pretty, you know, I'd be happy if you go to 30, but this is a number. So, and we have, so once we have those and we said, you know, let this, this is a target we can aim for. So where are we? And I'm just going to take you through some of the slides on this, uh, on this side where we are. So we have been making the silicon wafers. We now can make wafers again uh, using this technology. And you see a silicon wafer. So just to give you a perspective, we're not making hollow fiber membranes. We're making planar sheets. Now, if you look back in the literature of dialysis, in the late 60s, early 70s, there were parallel sheet dialyzers, uh, named the kill dialyzers. It's just an unfortunate name, but that's what it was, right? Uh, now, it turns out from a hydrodynamics perspective, a parallel plate structure is actually very efficient for blood flow. It may not be very efficient in terms of surface area, but it's very efficient for blood flow. So you can actually draw, drive blood with very little pressure drop across it. But the technology at the time was such that the membranes required so much surface area, it was the size of a, you know, one of the photocopiers. So we're actually going to a parallel plate type arrangement with our structure. So we'll have a sheets of membranes. And then here is actually a scanning electron micrograph of one of these sheets. And what you're seeing here is a seven nanometer pore. And the idea for a seven nanometer, we can tune this three nanometers, 15 nanometers. Seven nanometers happens to be a magic number at which you know, we know albumin doesn't go through. Uh, the, the hydrodynamic diameter of the albumin molecule is about seven nanometers. So if we pick something around that and we've confirmed this, uh, we can suddenly get very little or no albumin leakage. And if you look at this in cross section, we have pores that are very straight, that are very precisely controlled, and the membrane thickness here, as I show, is about 0.5 microns. Contrast that to the 30, 40 micron membrane, the thicknesses of conventional hollow fiber membranes. So what does this translate into? It translates a very high hydraulic permeability. So before I talk to you about 10 milliliters per minute, that's a 600 milliliters per hour. And we can actually run this off perfusion pressure. So it's 30 or 40 millimeter of mercury. We should be able to get 30 milliliters of clearance. So that's the thinking behind how we need to get to these numbers. And by, again, sticking to a technology that's manufacturable, and that's really important, uh, because many times we come up with new medical devices in the lab that really languish because there's no way to manufacture them beyond the lab. But I think by picking the technology that's available in Silicon Valley, we have a way to expand on that. So the other question comes up, you're working with silicon. Now, some of you who know, remember a little bit about chemistry, silicon is covered by a thin layer of silicon dioxide, silica. And people who used to do old time you know, blood tests, you put blood in a test tube, shake it, and that activated silica clots the blood. So the question is, wow, you're gonna put silica in contact with blood? That's actually going to be very bad for the membrane. Right? So that got us to thinking, how do you prevent blood clots in the membrane? So one way is you say, geez, there's so many chemicals, so much chemistries in implantable devices, you know, uh, surgical tools that you can apply to the membrane and that won't clot the blood. Turns out most of those coatings are so thick that if you had applied them on our membrane, they just block the pores. 
So it required us to come up with a way, uh, with a, first of all, a, chemi a set of chemistries and techniques that we can apply to the membranes such that, one, you can coat the membranes without blocking the pores. So the technology we use is something called self-assembly monolayers. So what is it? You basically covalently leak one layer of the chemistry on the membrane. It self-limits. After that, it does not re continue to react anymore. So through this attachment technique, you can basically get one layer of polyethylene glycol that does not block the pores, but it's, as far as blood is concerned, it's polyethylene glycol. And we've got a couple of other uh, chemistries we are very excited about. One is this uh, oligosaccharide that's actually derived from the glycocalyx of endothelial cells. And the, the other one is a zootyronic polymer. And here is some data on fibrinogen adsorption on the membranes over 30 days. The uh, light blue is polyethylene glycol. Now, why do we pick polyethylene glycol? It's a standard material. The FDA knows it. Everybody understands performance. But as it turns out, over a period of a month, it starts hydrolyzing away from the surface. It's a chemistry uh, challenge. So there are ways we can improve that. But we thought the other two chemistries we have are very stable. So the synthetic glycocalyx is stable over the 28 days. And then the zootyronic polymer, we actually don't see any degradation at all over that experimental time period. And these are three chemistries. There are others, obviously. But these are, in all of them, the idea is you're attaching covalently one monolayer or two monolayers, depending on how we want to do it, and then exposing it and in basically avoiding the need for protein, uh, negating the need that pro for proteins to attach to the surface. So we actually took one of these membranes. Uh, this is a small prototype. Here's the membrane chip in this little benchtop circuit. We ran uh, bovine blood for 10 days. And the idea here was not so much gross thrombus formation or whatnot, but what is the performance of the membrane over the 10 days? So what we did was we looked at the flux of the membrane on day one, and then looked at the flux on the membrane every day. And it was, we put it in, it just dropped by 3% and stayed constant for throughout the rest of the uh, test. What that told us was our coding was stable, was not, was not one, uh, moving off the membrane. But secondly, it was not, uh, it was doing its job of trying to pretend, uh, retard protein fouling. So with that uh, progress, we said, well, let's continue to advance the filter technology. So the next idea was, and this is a series of studies we have started, uh, and. Uh, you can see it's, a, it's going to be a canine implantation. I should just say, people have asked us, have we done work with you know, smaller animals? We have, but a lot of the effort is now focused on large animals because, as somebody said, you know, mice are not humans. So here is actually a recent uh, surgical uh, uh, implant and explant where we've taken the filter, which is what you have here, a PTFE grafts in a mongrel dog, and ran it for seven days, and this is a seven day, we've gone as long as 30 days uh, now. And what you're seeing here is ultrafiltrate being collected. And the key goal of this particular study, and this again, this sort of the excruciating things you have to do to build confidence, is one, will blood continue flowing? Two, will the membrane perform and generate ultrafiltrate, and we do. And then three, you know, how's the animal reacting to this. So this is some very preliminary analysis. So here we're looking at you know, the sort of the standard markers. But for me, what's interesting is one, the material did not really have any observable effect on the, on, the, on, the, on the animal. So that was important because if you go back 20, 30 years, when we used to use different membrane materials like cellulose, that would actually have an effect on the patient. So trying to answer that question up front was important to us. Secondly, in this system of where you have this a surgical handling of the device, sterilization, uh, attachment, pulsation, will you actually have filtration and will you have breakage? And we did not have that. And as you can see, the albumin saving coefficients, there's no uh, pr practically none. So those are the, the, those are, these are small scale devices. This would not be suitable for humans. So where are we headed? So what we take that data now, and we're building larger versions of the device. So this is, we're working towards this size, on the filter, and here's one that's titanium, and we've built it up with a lot of membranes. And here now we have started doing some extracorporeal studies, 
to show that one, the blood flow is maintained, it provides the right amount of clearance, and what you're seeing here in the CT scan, and you really can't see it very well, but there's a contrast front, and the idea was can we actually detect flow, and is it uniform, and the answer was yes. And uh, second, after you explant it, you know, are there any growth thrown by? Not really, I mean, there's some of the connectors uh, of the uh, tube here, but that really was, I think, more from the tube than our device. And we ran this in pigs, you know, four, six hours, a number of them, and the key was, you know, how do the membranes perform in terms of clearance? And, you know, we looked at sort of the standard, you know, nit uh, uh, urea and creatinine, and our data, this is the membranes that are not optimized necessarily for um, dialysis, but at least uh, we did that. We are comparing very well with an optiflux membrane. So we, we, we had numbers that are very comparable to sort of what's out there in the state of the art. So with this, I think the next, the next step for us is to continue to improve the membranes so that you know, we can take it to the implant and build a larger device and implant it in the animal. So I'll focus a lot on this membrane and the mechanical filtration, the sort of glomerulus, so to speak. How about the rest of it, the biological part? And the other goal is really focusing on human renal tubule cells. For a number of reasons, primarily regulatory, we're not working with animal cells, we're not working with you know, stem cells, and the feeling was with the burden that's out there in terms of regulation, let's see if we can't work with human cells. So working with my colleagues in Michigan who have worked on this for 20 years now, I think we have ways to basically get cells and isolate them from you know, transplant discards and expand them over a number of cycles. In fact, in one of the experiments uh, they've shown is that you can take one gram of biopsy tissue and go through 17 doublings and still maintain phenotype. Now this, for the people who have some basic, uh, some, understand some of the cell biology challenges, this is not trivial and we have to do a lot more work to show that these cells actually maintain long-term phenotype. But at least for four to six months, we've shown that the cells are viable. And one of the cool things they did was, well, let's isolate the cells, expand them, and can you put them in liquid nitrogen? So they're stored. And then when you need them for the appropriate patient, we can thaw them out. So that's what that graph on the right hand is saying. Is for four months, they have done so. Then actually what they do is they freeze the cells for a month, take it out, and we're able to recover the phenotype. So we, with that idea of cell sourcing, at least some traction of the cell sourcing, the key is how do you build a bioreactor this component that will go in here. This is very engineering oriented, but we had to take another toolkit called microfluidics and biochip analysis, which is being used mostly for genome uh, analysis and PCR. But we're using that technology to build uh, microfluidic bioreactors on which you can grow the cells and apply control shear stress. And by doing that, we can actually modulate the volume reabsorption. And one of the questions is, well, do the cells behave as you want them to do, and will they maintain their barrier function? It's no good if you're getting all this ultrafiltrate and you know, urea is getting back in. So I'm pleased to say with working with one of my colleagues in nephrology, uh, Paul Brakeman, who we've actually taken the cells all the way, in this case, uh, some model cells, uh, all the way to two months. And he's starting the series with human cells. And a lot of this work, I think, is really about the engineering of the bioreactor, keeping the right flow conditions to go and the other question that comes up is, well, are these the cells that you think they are? And so what we've been doing is looking at different assays to understand that they're cells. And what you see here is cell cultures, and you've got the brush, brush border here with uh, tight junctions, as you might expect, and the mitochondria. So giving us much confidence that at least phenotypically, the cells are the renal tubular epithelial cells and have the right markers for the proximal tubule. The other question is, well, so now you're gonna, you, got, you have these cells, so how are you gonna put them together, and will they actually reabsorb water? And will they reabsorb water without leaking? So for this, what we did is an experiment where we are taking, again, with, us, with our system, uh, basically testing the reabsorption pathway. So you can take cells under different conditions, uh, oncotic gradients, whether it's using albumin or mannitol, and you can see how much water goes through from the ultrafiltrate side back into blood. And you get a number that's, if you extrapolate, turns out to be about close to about 30 liters or so that we can achieve in a day, today, 
we might go higher, not the 43, but about 33 right now. But what is more interesting is if we do knock out that reabsorption pathway with obeying, we can actually inhibit it. So telling us we are really doing active reabsorption and not just leakage. So together, I think what we've shown in the, is that we've got cells that we can grow and plate for a long time. We can isolate them, and this is actually active reabsorption. The work that's going on in the lab is to play with different sort of engineering uh, systems, optimize them, and then showing that this actually holds out for the human cells for a long time. So we call this sort of the phase one of our project, not necessarily the phase one clinical, but phase one of the project, where we think we've achieved three things. We've basically built a membrane technology that outperforms the polymer hollow fiber membranes, both in terms of mechanical uh, filtration. Uh, and the other thing I did not say was the membranes, are, the pores are so small that they also actually provide a barrier to some of the immunological components from the host. Now, it's not as great, it's not perfect, but I think the way I talk about it is we'll be able to minimize some of the immune suppression drugs because you actually are able to sterically keep the, the patient's immune system from the cells. We've got biocompatible coatings that are very promising, at least for 30 days or more. Uh, and these coatings, the polyethylene glycol is well established by the FDA. The other two are things we have to work on. And the bioreactor, I think we've been able to show active water reabsorption. My colleagues have shown some of the other uh, biological uh, performance in terms of you know, the markers of proximal tubule cells. But also clearly, we can store the cells in liquid nitrogen, thaw them, and recover the phenotype. So with that, we, know, we started saying, well, how do we move to the next level? And I'm very excited to say we partnered up with the FDA, because a key challenge, as you know, with any medical device development is they're getting regulatory approval. So working with the FDA and UC, uh, UCSF has been able to build a regulatory pathway plan, which basically lays out ahead for us, these are the milestones we need to meet. And if we meet them, they will not go back on their word. Now, they always reserve the right, obviously, but at least we have the commitment from the reviewers, the brand chiefs, and the division chiefs, and the commissioner that as long as you meet these milestones, we're committed. So in the, for those of you who know something about the FDA and companies and why they get criticized is company does the clinical trial, goes back to the FDA. FDA says, that's not what I told you to do. They go back, do something they thought they're supposed to do, come back, it's a different person, it's a whole different challenge. So we're trying to avoid that. So we are hoping by partnering up with the FDA, we can get to the first clinical trials in 2017, assuming you know, our, both our technical and financial milestones come through. So where are we? So we've got the hemofilter by itself, we've got the bioreactor by itself. Now the challenge and the work that's going on, and we have some of my colleagues in nephrology, some of the colleagues in surgery, helping to partner with us to build integrated, inter, integrated units we can test in the lab, in the clinic, in the animal lab. So the idea is, and this is sort of the model that I'm showing here. So this is the device that integrates the filter and the cells into a single unit, and we're gonna start clinical trial, uh, rather animal trials of this device implanted at UCSF, we're hoping later this year. So that's my story, and thank you for your attention. So the question is, how do we solve the, the issue of interface between blood vessels and the device? And it's not a trivial issue. So uh, uh, the way I, will, I, I address that is it's not, a, it's not an issue I can solve by myself. And we're going to draw on people who have worked in another place where there's a lot of blood contacting device, which is in the area of ventricular assist devices, LVADs, and uh, blood pumps. So my hope and we're talking to some of my colleagues in surgery at UCSF, is to leverage the knowledge that there has gone in 20, 30 years of the right sort of connection between the met metallic VAD to the Dacron graft, the Dacron to the vessel, and leverage that knowledge for us. So we, it's absolutely correct. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference, right? That's a high flow 
high volume regime. We are basically low flow, low volume regime. So it will present some interesting challenges. And starting this year, when you start doing some of the animal experiments and couple that with our engineering work, we are hoping that we'll at least start getting some traction there. In the 30-day studies that we've done with the, uh, and the seven-day studies, it was taking PTFE grafts uh, and attaching them uh, just with good surgeons. Yes. The question is, how do you monitor the liability of cells? That, yeah, so are the cells working, you mean? Well, I mean, let's assume you're dying off a certain rate. How do you know when you're yeah. going So it's a good question. How do you know the cells are dying off, and how do you know what's up? So there's probably two ways, I think, uh, I've thought about, at least I should say my team has thought about that. So if the cells were dying, what you'd see is that you should, you'd see an increase in ultrafiltration, so you, in net output. So I guess at that point, um, you, you know that something is happening with the cells and you need to bring the patient back in and whatnot. But, so you would know, I think, just readily by seeing how much volume comes up. Now, in terms of um, some of the other markers, uh, and if you go with some of the uh, markers for AKI type injury, if those cells were not working, the sudden labs that would show up. But, and then that's probably the two ways we'd think about it. Yes. I noticed your um, filter ultrafiltration rate was uh, 600 milliliters per uh, milliliter squared per minute. Your cell absorption rate is only 250 microliters per centimeter squared per day. So how are you going to engineer this yeah. to reabsorb that? <laughs> Somebody has sharp eyes. So the cells here. <laughs> Yeah, so you're right, absolutely right. If we extrapolate the cells, um, I took this, it's just gonna be a couple of liters a day. What we found out is, and those, that, the, the graph I show here is based on, uh, let's see if I have it, is based on no shear. It turns out, if you put shear on these cells, and I have it uh, somewhere else, uh, uh, it's not, it's just I don't have it in this presentation. The, the, the reabsorption rate goes up uh, dramatically. So it goes up over a factor of 10. But you have to have shear. This was done without any shear. So the numbers I've gotten as far as the shear, with shear has been about, if you to extrapolate that number, it's about 30 liters as what I would achieve. So we're still down from the 43 if we had no shear or very low shear, we'd be in the, in the range of liters per day. But I think we can, uh, if everything works, we can probably get to the 20 to 30 liters. Uh, and some of the work we're doing now uh, with cell optimization uh, would probably head, uh, let us push that further towards the higher 30s. Well, I noticed that the brush border on those cells is very poorly developed. Would love, would, yep, would love, would love more expertise and help, absolutely. No, that's absolutely, you're absolutely true. I'm not trying to be facetious. It is true that this area, um, the work that we're doing um, here uh, does require additional optimization and the, the cell effort um, is not sort of, has not been our key strength, obviously. We've worked with, we've taken an engineering approach, but working with colleagues that can help us in the cells would welcome that. Yeah. So as a corollary from learning from the mechanical assist devices and Alban, et cetera, how wedded are you from to the no pump uh, model? Because these people have lived with Alban for eight, 10 years mm -hmm. sometimes, all of whom need a pump and need the actual assistance. And there are obviously many new ways to have batteries be rechargeable remotely without having to go in yeah. physically. So I'm wondering whether you're truly 100% wedded to the no pump, if that's a no, no non There's a lot of advantages of having a pump. Right. So the question is, you know, are we wedded to the no pump? I do not know that, I think the way to say it is we, the general feedback is if you can avoid a pump, you avoid a lot of the issues uh, of the, the pump malfunction, but I think it's fair to say that at least in, the, in our development pathway, we'll have to try out a pump, even for safety 
purposes to make sure there's always sufficient blood flow. And depending on the charging mechanism uh, that, and that those technologies are developing, uh, it's very conceivable that we could always have a small pump. Thank you. Thank you.